writer-director of this film, Haifa Al-Mansour, and the producer, Amy Baer. How did the two of you join forces on this film? Um, well, um, first of all, thank you all for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Um, I read the script in 2012. Um, I had just started my production company. I had been a studio executive for many, many years, and a friend of mine at, who represented Emma Jensen, the writer, had sent it to me, and um, I was really mesmerized by the story primarily because it was a story I had no idea existed. I mean, I was an English major in college and was embarrassed to realize that even though I had read Frankenstein, studied it, I never knew the backstory. I knew it was written by a woman, but never really knew the backstory and was really taken by the personal aspect of it, that this was birthed out of a life experience that a very young woman had had. And I also was very struck by the fact that it was very relatable um, in a very modern way you know, about a young woman and first love and passion and pushing limits. And so um, I got involved in it and I had been very um, focused on finding a woman director because um, I felt that while it would have been easily makeable by a man or a woman, I felt that a woman director would have a life experience that would somehow tap into what Mary went through in her life. It's just, it, there is a difference to being a woman trying to find your voice creatively, artistically, personally, professionally, and that's not something that's changed in 200 years. Um, and I had seen Wajda, and I loved it, and I was really also um, struck by the fact that the theme of that movie and what that young woman went through in Wajda was very similar to the struggle that Mary had, and that was there was a difference of 200 years, so it was still happening. Um, so I sent it to her agent, and very happily she responded. Absolutely. Well, on Haifa, how did you get involved in this? Um, here we go. Well, thank you so much for coming today. And this is, um, it has been an amazing journey. After Amy sent it to my agent, and it was really like, um, I was like, She's English and uh, period, uh, I'm from Saudi Arabia, <laughs> I'm not sure, but it's amazing when I read the script, it's amazing as Amy said, it is this little girl who's trying to find her voice and assert herself in England when it was conservative, nothing like Saudi Arabia, <laughs> yet it is very, um, they expected women to be in a certain way and act in a certain way, and Jane Austen was the star who wrote about um, social commentary and about love and marriage and all that. And, um, and she wrote something totally different. So that is, uh, I felt it is very important to tell her story. Because I was also a literature major. And I, I read Frank Stein and I, I wrote a paper on Mary Shelley, but never stopped on, on, at her life. And it is so sad that is, um, the monster overshadowed her success. Like he was, every, the monster is in the cartoon, the pop culture, everything. But she's still not a household name. And um, I think if it were a man who wrote that book, we would have seen, we would, he would have been way more famous. And it is, it is sad that women don't get the same kind of recognition when they conquer new frontiers and create genres. And, and it was time to tell that story. Absolutely. Well, and was it interesting to, uh, was there a lot to draw on from this period of time, uh, journals or documentation to go back to, or was it uh, primarily Frankenstein, and uh, what kind of research did you do, I guess? Oh, there's a lot. There is so much, and we couldn't put everything, and we wanted a sort of a blueprint um, to what we can put and not put in their, in their life. They, ha they went through a lot. And it was very important to to um, assert Mary, Mary Shelley as the writer of Frankenstein, and that is why we wanted to choose and pick events that uh, correlate to the creation of the book. A lot of people say the book is masculine because it is um, it is about creating a new genre and it's about like um, philosophy. It is not something expected from a woman, 
but everything is in the book is direct result of her um, life as a woman. She went she of a loss of a child and her relationship with her husband and the weight of her parents' legacy. All that is in the the theme the, the themes in the book very much mirrored her life. So that is why we try to choose things like this. But uh, there is so much there are journal, journals and letters and. And people documented their trips. They took trips around Europe. So. Well, and I understand that the church scene was actually kind of crucial for you uh, because of the moral choices involved. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that scene and, and Which the, church? Um, the church scene where Percy yeah. and Mary uh, first sort of consummate the relationship. And, and I wonder, you know, whether that was figuring out those moments to show those kinds of choices. Well, Amy told me that we can, it was supposed to be in a boat. They told me, it's going to rain. We can't be in a boat. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> we have to take it now. We have, and for me, it, and then we, um, we came up with the church scene. And the church scene, is, is, I feel like for creators, for people of that, to create something that is so beautiful and so daring and so challenging the, the time, the, the doctrines of the time, you have to challenge religion because sometimes religion shapes us in a way that is we accept things. And as young pers as young people, they must have gone through that to to come to be that creative. It is very important to not to to give in to things that are very established if you want to be a creator. And they they did that, and and it is it was important to show that. Um, and uh, yeah, what do you think, Amy? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think specific to the church scene, I mean, I mean, it's true what Haifa says. We had practical issues we had to deal with as well as creative ones. Um, I do think that that scene does shorthand a lot of what the two of them were up against. Um, you know, there was this um, Church of England component to their existence because they grew up in London, in England, um, and... Aside from it's just, it's a date, right? And that you want to go somewhere where they can be a little more subversive and he's naughty and, and pushes the boundaries. Um, there was, we didn't have the time to go through all of everything he had been through at Oxford and getting expelled and what he wrote about and, um, you know, his first wife and what, what society was already saying about him. And we didn't have the time to explore her mother either. So... Uh, Haifa very cleverly came up with a way to kind of meld all of that together um, and it was sort of one of those happy things that comes out of what you think is going to be a disaster on you know that week because you know the weather is not going to cooperate and allow you to shoot it where you wanted to shoot it to begin with. Well, and I wanted to ask also, something that's truly remarkable about this film is that it was shot in Ireland and Luxembourg, and I heard of script meeting, and, and, yeah, and, France. And, and France, and I understand that there were script meetings that took, a, took place across three different continents at times. What was it like coordinating an international production like this? Um, it was complicated. Um, it was... You know, the irony is it's a movie that takes place in England, and it was too expensive to shoot it in England. So that was number one. And number two, um, London has become a very popular place to shoot, particularly for very, very big movies, big tentpole films. So a lot of the crew is, is taken up with that. So um, we, I, we had a partner, um, a production company called Parallel Films, who were based in London and in Dublin, and they were able to figure out how to put together this Irish Luxembourg co-production, um, which is so often the way independent film gets made now. You know, you you cobble together pieces of financing from here and over here, and then I mean, on on watch day you had German money, right? Yes. Um, so I mean, a story about Saudi Arabia was in no small part financed by Germany. So um, so it was sort of, again, out of necessity. And we were able to delineate pretty clearly that the exteriors would happen in Ireland, in and around Ireland, because we had a stage in Luxembourg City where we could build the interiors. And that, that sort of helped us organize the production. But it was interesting. I mean, Al Fanning and I were the only Americans in the movie. It was really funny. Everybody else was 
Saudi and Luxembourgian and Belgian and and Irish and it was and British. So it was truly this international collaboration. But once it was all put in place that way, it was fairly seamless. Absolutely. Well, and one more before I turn it over to the audience. Uh, one of the things that I loved that I heard was that there was sort of a no corsets rule on this film, <laughs> and that this yeah. was going to be modern. Uh, well, this is the, the, the actresses made that rule. <laughs> they just rebelled with like the, the corset. And it was amazing because it is really like we didn't want to be, we wanted to stay true to the period, but also we wanted to, to depict young people who are rebelling against that, uh, all the rules. And um, yeah, so they decided, <laughs> they came one day and was like, we decided we don't want to wear a corset <laughs> because it is within the character. <laughs> But it is, yeah. It was amazing dealing with young actors. They brought a lot of life and a lot of energy, and and it was really hard in the film to shoot across across so many countries because some of the scenes are fragmented. And sometimes we will take L coming entering in Dublin and this coming from outside in Dublin, and then we take her in Luxembourg, and it is um, it is difficult to keep the same energy and um, uh, on the level of performance and everything. So uh, they did an amazing job, just like gluing everything. And we had a wonderful art uh, designer, Packy Smith, who made it seamless. Like when you watch the film, you don't see that you are, are uh, all over the world. Like you, you don't feel that. And it is wonderful to deal with uh, that kind of talent and caliber. Absolutely. Well, let me take a few questions from the audience. Does anybody have any? Yeah. How long did it take to shoot and how much did it cost? I'll leave it how much, to, seven, I think it's eight or seven weeks to shoot, oh, it was, but I, I'm, I'm leaving the budget issues to you. <laughs> it was uh, 33 days total, um, with four days off for travel, so you get this sort of weird interim break where you get to move everyone from one country to another, um, and it was eight million US. Thank you, whoever said thank you. Um, I liked Ellen in the movie, but but did you consider a British actress for the role? Yes, we did. Um, we the the my first goal was to find a filmmaker, and I really wanted Haifa, and I was really happy when she said yes. And then the second step was we started looking for Mary, and um, one of the things that Haifa felt very strongly about, and I agreed with, was she had to be true to the age, that there was a, there was a crop of actresses um, that were age appropriate. And we didn't really want to go down a road where we were hiring a 25 year old to play 16. We could have. Um, so it narrowed it a little bit. Um, so, and then it became about who, and Haifa will speak to this because she's very articulate about YL. Um, we did look at a bunch of actresses across all nationalities, but um, Elle had a very specific balance, and I, you should talk about that because you're so. Yeah, I love I loved Elle performance since Super Eight. She is very effortless and subtle in her performance, and the and the role has like a mother who's like having losing a child, and there is there is um, there is a trick that you might fall into becoming too melodramatic if you have some actress who cannot bring that cinematic feel to it. And Elle can effortlessly elevate the scenes. And um, she was a natural choice for me. And I saw her in Ginger and Rosa, where she was playing um, a British uh, kid. And she did amazing with the accent. And she did amazing even carrying herself very proper, like British. And I felt she is the, um, she, has, she has what it takes to bring Mary Shelley in, uh, into the world. And um, it was, I, I really enjoyed working with her, too. She's such an amazing, hardworking young actress and uh, I'll, let, I'll let Amy talk when she was sick actually when she we were sh shooting the day after losing the child she was actually had fo food poisoning and she insisted on coming to set and and filming yeah I mean it was <laughs> luckily for her she just laid in bed literally it was laying in bed and it was awful because she she would like do the scene hypo would say cut and she would roll over and be sick and then roll back over and do it but it worked but the other thing about Ellen the role is um, she lacks pretense as a teen. I mean, she's now almost 20. Well, she is 20. But um, the time we shot it, she was 17. She had not quite turned 18. And 
there were moments where you forgot that she was 17 when you were just dealing with her because she's so mature and there were other moments where she was acting like a true teenager and a lot of actresses her age don't have that they're they're so professional that they have a, a precociousness to them that doesn't feel natural and i think that's what hype is talking about that effortlessness she she brought that she was able to understand Mary the teenager, which was really important to both of us, that we tapped into the fact that a woman, this woman experienced this life between the ages of 16 and 17, and by the time she was 18 was writing a book about it, so. Brother? Hi, um, I just want to say I really love the film. Congratulations to both of you for the film. And um, I was wondering, if I'm not mistaken, Mary Shelley, um, you know, in the movie it shows that she had a child and lost a child, but from my understanding in history, she had a few miscarriages. Okay. I, my question to you guys is why did you choose not to go that route and talk about the miscarriages? Because um, it's such a significant part of her writing Frankenstein, from my understanding, okay. and the way it's portrayed in the movie is she has a child so naturally, but I know she struggled a lot to get to that, to eventually having a child. So, um, just to shorthand it, I mean, you're right. There's a lot of story that we couldn't tell. Um, we went back and forth on a lot of that. I mean, there's there's that piece of it. There's a whole subplot that was in the original script, but Haifa made some wise choices about for time um, about Percy and Claire. I mean, it's pretty well documented that they were most likely having a an affair right in front of right under her nose. Um, so it was very difficult, and I think what Haifa was hoping to accomplish was to, again, dramatic license, just kind of combining all of that struggle into the, the birth and the ultimate, very, in very short order, the loss of that child. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. We also felt the loss of a child is very dramatic, and we don't have to repeat that experience, and especially in a film. We could do that if it is, was more like a TV show where you have more time to... To, to have time pass and lose another child. But it is such, an, such a big moment that you cannot really repeat in a film. So we could, yeah, so that is, that is why we chose to, to put um, all the emotional weight on losing the child and hoping that it achieves the same effect of, um, of yes, because it is very important in creating Frankenstein and we wanted to show that. But I don't think the film could have carried Losing more than one child. I'm going to add one more thing. Um, I think you did a fantastic job as, as how Mary Shelley and Moody felt so abandoned by you know creating this monster. It also showed the parallel between feeling abandoned by the men who was involved in life. And in some writings I read about Mary Shelley, it romanticized it like there was someone loved, but you really showed the complexities of their relationship very well. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely, and I think we've got time for one more, and I'm going to go up there. Well, I just want to say congratulations on <clears throat> the film, and I appreciate all the shorthand you have to do. The story would have been impossible to tell. And that <laughs> final scene where you see her dressed beautifully, holding the hand of a small child, that was her son, mm -hmm. that survived her, and Percival Shelley. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. Thank you. Well, I have to give a lot of credit for Amy for that uh, scene. It is. She fought so much. Me and I, we fought. We fought a lot on that scene. But yeah, we're glad that you you liked it. And actually, because I saw one more hint, could I? Yeah. Have you ever seen Gothic? I haven't. You've never seen it. That's another Mary Shelley story. But Ken Russell, it has a very arch kind of a, a tone that I just thought we wanted to contrast. But I guess you, if you haven't seen it. We haven't seen it, and our film is better. It's a 30-year-old film. <laughs> <laughs> 30 I agree. And, uh, yeah, I just want to thank Amy and Haifa for being here, and thank you all again for coming out. Yeah. <laughs>